Well, this week is a kind of a random contact that turned into a really interesting interview, but also probably one of the most distracted interviews that we had. There were kids and dogs and sirens and uh, at one point a bad internet outage that wiped out a little bit of the conversation, but um, we muscled through it and the end result is this really cool interview with John Keston. Hope you enjoy. Okay, this week I am pleased to introduce you to uh, a fellow I met virtually. We've never met face to face, although uh, he lives in an area I go to occasionally, so I'm going to try have to find a way to make it happen. His name is John Keston, and um, he contacted me a while back and he introduced me to some of his music, and I was frankly quite blown away. It's kind of that thing that I like, which is it's electronic, but not overtly so. It's sound designerly. It's a pretty amazing release, and I was really, uh, I was really excited to listen to it, and then excited to talk to John about it. So, with that introduction, I give you John Keston. Hi, John. How are you? Hi, Darren. I'm really good. Thank you for that uh, introduction, and just I really appreciate that you enjoy the the music. It was really fun to produce, and uh, Lister is amazing as well. And he just he did a really great job on on some of the production of that. So, yeah. Well, I just I just found it really interesting to hear something, you know. And and I'm I'm being quite serious in that in the front end because it seems so often when people do work and people who describe themselves as being interested or focused on sound design. When they do a work that's about sound design, it, it a lot of times it really sounds like, hey, look at me, look at my fabulous design. Almost as, I, I would say the parallel is like people who are really good uh, visual effects people, when they make a movie, it's all about the visual effects, right? Mm-hmm. For some yeah. reason in this thing it was... Uh, the the wonderful sound design, but it just kind of really slotted itself in nicely, and it didn't it didn't have that look at me quality to it. Yeah, I think I think one of the things I do with um, and I've I've always been a, f- a fan of like monosynths, and I've had vintage monosynths for uh, a long time, um, and I you know I play Rhodes, I play piano, but um, the thing about a monosynth that I like is you've got the whole the whole array of controls are right there and I never even use patches I have a a Moog Sub 37 and I've dialed in one patch that is sort of my starting place for everything else instead of like you know oh maybe for this song I'll use this patch and this song will use this patch I'll I'll just start with that patch and then if I need to change it then I I know where to go you know what I'm saying right that's uh it's actually a lot of how I use the modular, especially when I'm performing live, is mm-hmm. that um, it it really represents the lack of presets, but a stable starting point that is comfortable, mm-hmm. and and yeah. that that's a neat way to work. Um, so why don't we kick this off by having you sort of identify yourself? Okay. Yeah. I think- there's a number of facets. Like I definitely, first of all, identify as, as a musician. And one of the things that's happened is, you know, like throughout my life, music hasn't really paid me a whole lot of money. I don't know if you can identify with that, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I haven't made a whole lot of money. I mean, I, I still consider myself a professional. I do make money at times, but it's not enough to you know live on. And so I've I've been doing other things. And one of the things I got involved in. Early on was computer science, so I was I studied computer science for a little while in college. I never finished my CS degree. Um, I went into music technology, and that's when I got my BA. But um, because of the starting off in computer science, I ended up, you know, doing doing um, sort of software gigs as a uh, basically as a way to support music, and um, I ended up doing a lot of web technology stuff, and uh, that led me into education um, later on and so I started teaching this stuff interaction and and a lot of like motion scripting kinds of things um, and I was always interested about how uh, you know once I started teaching this stuff how it was all really focused on visuals and there wasn't as much sound going on within you know this this sort of interact interactive software realm so right. 
so I started looking into that and saying, well, well, why isn't that the case? And I started doing things that were more involved with sound. So I sort of secondarily, you know, identify as a software um, developer or, you know, sort of as this computer programmer guy who wants to, you know, make things that can help with making music, you know. Right. Well, it seems like you and I actually kind of run along parallel tracks a little bit uh, because that's kind of my story, too, the... You know, especially if you if you sort of have, like in my case, I generated a family fairly early, so that had some financial requirements to it. But it, it's interesting how at the time that I, I started doing the coding thing, there was not much of a matchup between music and computer programming, and where there was was kind of the wild, wild west, right? Yeah. And um, that certainly isn't the case anymore. And like now I, I teach in an art department at a school, but I teach sound art, which is really interesting, and uh, creative coding, which is also really interesting. All things that weren't even on anyone's radar a few years ago. And I think it's it's pretty amazing that kind of the doors of opportunity swung and I happen to be in a place to step through. What was the mechanism that swung the doors open for you? Is it just... Because you're teaching now, right? Yeah, and I think that's that really was the opportunity for me was was getting involved in teaching because because before that, you know the the programming gigs were more or less you know okay well I know how to do this stuff and so it's paying the bills and then I can you know go play gigs at night and I I play I've consistently played performed you know like somewhere between two and four times a month you know with with various projects and so. I'm always doing that, but that's never enough to right. really live on. But when I started teaching, it sort of, you know, I'd, I had, I'd been using computers. I mean, my first computer was like a Commodore 64, and I actually did MIDI with that, with this software called Sonus Super Sequencer. It had eight tracks of MIDI. <laughs> and one of my first synths was a Korg Poly 800, and I would hook up the Korg Poly 800 to this and, like, layer as many tracks as it would do polyphonically and just create these these kind of bizarre classical compositions when I was a kid. But, um, you know, I left that alone for a while because, you know, the music thing was, I was more focused on technique as a musician. Right. Yet I still had this sort of interest in technology and then I was working in technology. But not until I started teaching did I really sort of start to say, hey, I want to combine these things. I see. And, That's you know, And start because suddenly I didn't have this pressure on me to be, you know, on the computer all day, you know, making stuff for other people. Now I was, you know, using computers in the teaching, but it freed me up to sort of like explore other areas and that could contribute to my teaching practice as well. Got it. Right. Um, so one of the things when I did a little research on you, I saw that, uh, this idea of, sort of like mixing and matching uh, sound and music to art kind of is a two-way street. So you, on one hand, you're bringing music to uh, to sort of like the visual arts world, but I also noticed that I think it was your MFA thesis, um, and subsequent to that, you've done things with graphical scores. And I'm fascinated with graf- graphical scores, in different ways of scoring performance. And um, tell me a little bit about your approach to that. Yeah, I would say um, one of the major influences for me in that regard was one of my former professors during undergrad. Um, I'm not sure if you know him, but his name is uh, Dr. David Means. Oh, yes. Um, and uh, so he's done some amazing things with, um, you know, he has a, a dis- uh, background in architecture, and he so does these uh, beautiful architectural kind of visuals or graphical scores. And um, I think my approach to it has been not necessarily in in that tradition, but um, doing things with, um, my, I guess one, one of the main things I wanted to do was do an audio visual score. And so if you think of an audio visual score, well, it's not just, it's not just um, a graphical score and it's not notation, but it's like sound and visuals combined and that's what you're responding to as an improviser right right and so i I started doing some experiments in grad school where i would um 
take like my uh, Korg um, monotribe and a uh, field recorder and go and sit next to a train and set up a binaural microphone and then I would record the binaural microphone and uh, listen to what was coming into the binaural microphone through headphones and then bring in like monophonic synthesizer lines and start manipulating that um, sort of in a response to what was happening with the uh, sound in the environment and I would shoot that on video as well and then put the binaural sound mixed together into the video and uh, so this is so for me, the idea was that the environment was sort of the audio-visual score. I see. Right. Okay. And so it's, you know, one of the things I love doing as a musician is improvising. And I work in, in, with a number of different groups who do um, free improvisation. And, uh, and for me, this is another way to kind of improvise. But there's this whole idea of, you know, we're, we're receiving all this information with our senses. And there's this idea of phonomnesis, which is essentially imagining sound. Okay. So we all imagine sound, right? I mean, it's like, but this is just a technical word that's been put on it. But, you know, how we imagine sound, why we imagine sound is really based on kind of what sort of sensory stimuli that we're experiencing. And so I'd put myself in these positions and say, okay, well, what kind of sounds would I imagine that would go along with this and then just try to do it on the spot and mix it in and sort of perform that. In the case of the uh, duets that I did with the Singing Ringing Tree in Northern England, this is a sculpture um, on a hill in Northern England that's made of these galvanized metal pipes. And they're in this incredible arrangement. This architectural firm called Tonkin Liu built this sculpture as a series, as one in a series of panopticons um, throughout England. And it's just gorgeous, and it's on this hill. And as the wind blows past all of these galvanized horizontal tubes, they're sort of in these spiral kind of arrangements, all of these different tones happen, right? And they're sort of microtonal. They're not really pitched in, I don't think they could be, pitched perfectly because the wind speeds change so frequently. Right, so it's, it's going to change the sound by yeah, its own purpose, yeah. And there's all this chaos happening within those frequencies. But it's just beautiful and haunting. And so just being in that environment and listening to it and then sort of responding to it with, with a synthesizer was, was sort of my goal there. So the audiovisual score itself is that environment. I if see. you look, you know, you, you look at the documentation for the piece... Essentially, what you're hearing is what I was hearing. I see. I there. Well, it's interesting because it's. I'm having. I I have to say I'm having trouble wrapping my head around it because when we talk in terms of like a graphical score, I think I'm I'm actually more inclined to immediately jump to the concepts of your teacher and thinking in terms of architectural, you know, structuring and sort of like the development of things that will remind me, you know, when to repeat and how often to repeat. And mm -hmm. it's it's hard for me to wrap my, my brain around the idea of an environment being a score. But of course it can be. And it especially makes a lot of sense then, or it ties together with some other things that I saw you had done, including things like doing live uh, performances uh, to... Uh, cinema works yeah. and stuff like that. So it seems like this improvis improvisational part of you kind of is infused in in all of it. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I think um, it's um, I think it's admitting that there's you know when you're improvising, you know we're, we we all have an influence. There's all some there's all kinds of influence, right? Influences as you're improvising, perhaps other musicians that you're playing with. Um, in, in the case of these scores, it's the environment around around you. But there's also your own history, right? And there's all the, uh, you know, the background that you have and, you know, what what you've listened to in the past and, you know, all of that thing, all of those things. So there's a whole series of things that sort of, you know, influence how you improvise. And I think these scores are a way to sort of admit that this improvisational process has this impetus, well, that actually gives me the opportunity to uh, sort of pivot into one of the questions I commonly ask people that I'm talking to, which is about your background. I'm, I'm curious, 
because you, I mean, again, I would say that in terms of sort of like background and interest and stuff, you and I have a very parallel track here. I'm curious to know where you came from. Uh, you know, what were your early influences? What are the, what are the things that made you the artist that you are today? No, I think probably, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my dad, who's also named John Keston. He was a, an opera singer and with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, I grew up in, in the United Kingdom. We moved to the United States when I was about 10. But, you know, my memories of England were basically hearing my dad sing opera practice practice for operas or musicals or whatever he was doing in the house. And we had a piano, and I had piano lessons as a kid for a few years uh, before we moved to the States. Uh, my dad took a teaching job there. Um, I didn't really have much in the way of consistent piano teachers after we moved to this country, but, you know, I was continually listening to music, and my dad had some pretty strange records. He, he uh, you know, he ended up with uh, Morton Sabot Sabotnik's um, The Wild Bull. was right. I think he borrowed it, and I remember listening to that and being like, what is this crazy <laughs> stuff, you know, as a kid. And then he also had, like, um, Tamita's uh, Firebird and pictures in an exhibition, and then I had a friend whose dad taught in the art department at the school where my dad en ended up having a job. And he was into, my friend's dad was into Laurie Anderson and Jean-Michel Jarre. And so I got exposed to that stuff pretty early on. And um, then, so it, throughout high school, and I started, you know, just kind of practicing piano and keyboards and playing with a few bands here and there, just wanting to be better as a musician and and then eventually, once I uh, left home, I started getting some sort of coaching, some jazz coaching, and sort of learned some jazz harmony and stuff and started playing uh, jazz standard, standards with people um, down in uh, Minneapolis, and, which is where I'm based now. And that kind of was sort of my upbringing and what got me into music. But I was always interested in sound synthesis and sound design, and so I, I could never leave that alone. You know, I always had to be playing around with that stuff. So, um, what were some what were some of the first ways that you experimented with sound sound design and playing with sound? Was it synthesizers or was it like tape recorders and stuff? What were the things that got you started in in playing with it? Yeah, I had a, I had a really good friend in in high school, and we used to make uh, we used to make uh, little mystery theaters. Uh, you know, re recording stuff off of, of records and uh, and then adding our own dialogue, and, you know, uh, in grade school. Um, so that was some of the early stuff. But then, you know, I did save up enough enough money where I think I actually sold a car that I inherited from my grandfather. Uh, my family weren't too happy about that. But um, <laughs> I sold it to buy, you know, a Korg Poly 800. And so I started experimenting with that before I bought that i had a moog rogue actually uh, that had a broken key which i got really cheap and i would run that through my friend's guitar pedals and you know make these whale sounds and you know right. with the delay and i was like oh my god this is just incredible you know these these sounds that are coming out of this thing and so uh you know and then i just kept going from there and i think the next thing i was doing was playing with a d50 and that was Roland D50 was really tricky to program, but, um, you know, I was at that, at that point I started, you know, doing technology in the workplace, you know, and, and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to start practicing piano. And I kind of went, went in this away from music technology for a little while and then got back to it later. Sure. So when you got back into it, um, I, you know, I'm always curious about people's entree into sort of like modern production tools and techniques you know so like mm -hmm. for me i uh i was away from from a lot of stuff and then i came back in still when dos machines were kind of viable and you know was running voyetra's little sequencer on a pc that was about as powerful as my iphone is now right? <laughs> yeah and it was amazing that it could do anything and i was just in i was so happy with that what mm -hmm. was when you kind of when when you got into music technology sort of i mean obviously in some way it it's infected you such that now you know you're 
you're into it full on. What was the thing? What was the thing that hooked you and, and brought you back in? I think I think it's it was sequencing on computers. You know, like I think I mentioned earlier, Commodore sixty four running Sonus super super sequencer. Um, eventually, that wasn't really much use to me anymore. But then um, eventually, I got like an Atari ST and was using Cubase. Right. And then, but then I was like frustrated because I couldn't. I couldn't do digital audio with that. I could only do MIDI, and I love MIDI. But I wanted to record digital audio, and I, I had an early PC, like 486, 33 megahertz, that I sort of built from parts to to run this saw, this yeah. software called Saw. Right, right. Um, and I had to have a special sound card with it, I think. And that that's when I first started doing, like, uh, digital recording. And I was recording, you know, like Rhodes electric piano, and synth lines and things like that, and then editing stuff together, and that's that. That really hooked me as well. And just from there, I, I never stopped. I kept building better computers. I went from that into like uh, Sonar, Cakewalk Sonar, right? And then from there, I got hooked on on Ableton Live. I started on version two of Ableton Live, and I've really been using it and building some Max for Live patches and things like that. Oh, that's fantastic. That's that's a neat. Route. Yeah, have you used? Um, there's a software called um, Photo Sounder. Ooh, uh, no, I haven't heard that. Yeah, there's this guy Michael. Uh, I think it's. I think his name's pronounced Michael Ruzik. Um, and uh, this software is really great. It's. Uh, I've used it. I've used it for a number of projects that, um, during my thesis, um, where I would convert the sound to this, you know, spectral analysis, and then, and then print that out. Um, perhaps screen print it and photograph it and then put it back into photo sounder and then and then here are the results of how that changed it's oh, interesting kind of process i did a number of pieces like that and the most recent one was actually shown um collaborating with this guy uh yashu stefanski um who's at uh, vcu and uh it was actually shown at a exhibition in tokyo so it was pretty exciting uh, it's really interesting so i'll have to I have to look into that. That sounds pretty interesting. I mean, I've I've played around with Metasynth over the years, which is mm-hmm. another one of these kind of mix and match graphical and, and um, audio related systems. Although that thing, I I I didn't get the right PhD, I think, <laughs> to understand that. So that that one's left me a little bit in a lurch sometimes. I mean, I can make it do squiggly squeal sounds, but I never could seem to get it to do anything intentional. Yeah, the nice thing about Photo Sounder is it's really simple. You know, I, I really only use it for translating um, the sound into visuals and then manipulating those visuals. One of the experiments I did was taking that sound or that visual, uh, that spectral analysis into Photoshop and then applying like a glowing edges filter, oh, right, which right. you wouldn't want to use for anything else, right? Sure. <laughs> it actually sounds really cool when you apply glowing edges to spectral analysis and then convert it back into sound again. It's almost like this beautiful chorus kind of sound you get out of it. Oh, that's cool. Well, and, and maybe what you've just done is identified something that um, all, of, all of the people who have these effects setups from 1992 will be able to get them out of the back closet and use them again because yeah like you said no one's been able to use a glow edges for 20 years without embarrassing themselves right yeah so um now one of the things that that kind of implies though is that uh you're kind of into this idea of interesting ways of sound degrading Mm-hmm. You know, because that to me, I mean, <clears throat> one of the things that, one of the pieces of, of music that I, and I'm going to blow it here because I won't be able to remember who it is that did it or, or anything, but uh, there was this piece of music where it was like um, a person recorded uh, a recorded environmental sound and then basically kept on sending it back and forth between two cassette recorders. Are you talking about Alvin Lucier? The. Uh no, this is yeah. I know what you're thinking. Oh, yeah, I'm actually that's, thinking that's, of no, that's in a room. That's yeah. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. It was somebody. It was a New York thing. It was somehow related to 9/11. And I, again, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get letters from people that are like, "You're an idiot." <laughs> it's this most important work from that time period or whatever. But um, the fact is, it was. It was really interesting because what you end up with is this kind of sense of 
of a technology causing a certain type of degradation. And you mentioned Lucien's uh, in a room, which is that's how a room causes things to degrade. But I think that, that people haven't necessarily been very creative about how computers um, cause things to degrade or how you can use computer technologies for this kind of degrading. Other than the, like, the most obvious like bit reduction things and stuff sure. like that, which I mean, yeah. even those, quite frankly, still sound pretty interesting and they've been around for a long time. Yeah. But especially when you start talking about these kind of like transmedia, uh, you know, transmedia movements, all of a sudden you have the ability to degrade things in really kind of useful ways. Yeah, I, that's one of the areas that I love researching. And um, one, of the, one of the experiments I did recently, I wouldn't call it a project yet, but um, I bought a Yamaha TX81Z FM synth. And uh, these things are, um, you know, they're notoriously hard to program, of course, because they're just, you know, a, a rack unit. But uh, there was an editor, a Max for Live editor, that um, had been built, and so I jumped off from that. I went into, uh, I opened that up in in uh, Max for Live, and added uh, sort of this idea of randomizing the parameters, but not just randomizing them, and then saying, "Oh, here's a random patch." But what I did is I set it up so that you could sort of degrade the patch over time. And what was happening is it would pull out of a hat. So I used the earn object in Max to. Oh, right, right decide what parameter it was going to change and then it would change it and it would either change it um, using interpolation to get to from where it was to where it was over a certain time period so it would scale it to the new position or it would just jump to the new position but you could have these parameters change at a, at a rate that you could set that you could either clock to the tempo or that you can just use a free running LFO to change at whatever pace that you want. Now, of course, a, a synth that old, like the TX81Z, can't really take parameters that fast, so you'll get these <laughs> MIDI buffer errors, errors if you're sending them way too fast. But um, just being able to sort of... I, 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 um, the analogy I came up with was like replacing bricks in a wall with like a loaf of bread or a shoe. or right. You know? So you're just... You know, you're degrading this patch over time. What's kind of fun to do is like to play the sound as it's degrading over time and then you know, and then record that process. Well, that's actually an interesting idea because that's, uh, first of all, because you're doing it against hardware. And so there, again, MIDI almost acts as this weird technological buffer between your code and what's generating the sound. But mm -hmm. also, uh, so for those people who don't know what the Max Earn object does, it it does random choices, but it prevents a repetition until it it uses up all the numbers. So basically, yeah. it allows you to do random. So in this case, if you're selecting your parameters, it means all of the parameters are going to get selected before you hit any of them a second time. Yeah, it's like shuffling cards. Versus, it's like shuffling cards, right, exactly. It's rolling dice. Yeah, which is why I don't understand why it was called urn, but, you know. <laughs> well, it's kind of like, if you think about it, I mean, an urn with... Names. It's like names oh, in a hat. I guess, yeah. That's the way I'd think of it anyway. Yeah, well, I think names <laughs> in a hat would have been a cooler name for it anyway, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> it's, it's longer. <laughs> longer. More typing. It's easier to type urn <laughs> than names in a hat. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was designed by someone who used it a lot. So we wanted <laughs> as few letters as possible. Um, but so now I, I have to ask why the TX81Z? I mean, you're right. It's, it is... Uh, almost impenetrable from a, you, you're never going to want to program it from the front panel. And even having worked with it in the past and using some uh, on-screen editors, it was a little bit uh, hieroglyphic laden. Um, yeah. What made you choose that? Was it because it was difficult or just because it was cheap? Well, no, actually, because it was easier than the FS1R, which I also, <laughs> also have one of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, there's like, what is it, 2,000 parameters in the oh, FS1R, something that thing's like that? insane. Well, it's got all those format filters and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. Crazy. It's an incredible instrument. But the TX81Z, it only has, it's only a four operator. Well, I mean, there's eight algorithms, but there's only four operators. 
And so it's a lot more manageable. I think, I think um, out of all of the parameters that there, there are, the core parameters that I chose to manipulate, there was 73. Okay. All right, so, so that's, that's pretty easy know, to wrap your arms around. Then, that's the know. envelopes. That's the envelopes for each operator. It's the waveform for each operator, the level of each operator, unless you disable the levels, which I have a, a checkbox in the patch that will allow you to disable the levels because if you do enable that as a, as a uh, parameter that can be modified, then sometimes you end up with like real quiet stuff. So sometimes it's nicer to just leave the levels alone and sure. manipulate other stuff. Right. So now you said that like with uh, your Moog that you kind of have a, a starter patch that you use as, as your mechanism. Do you use, the, do you use this, this system in live performance? Yeah, absolutely. So what, so I've, I like a handful of different projects. Um, I, I do solo electronic performances too that are just all hardware based. I use like an analog four from Electron. Right. So I use that with my duet project called Ostracon. It's me and this guy, Graham O'Brien, on drums. And that, that project is interesting because I was using the software that I made in processing called GMS. And that uh, stood for just gestural music sequencer. And what I did is I set up uh, this software that would take the input from the video camera and it would generate MIDI notes based on brightness tracking. And then I set up probability distribution so you could sort of design these scales and it would sort of fit within these scales or not or and uh, then I would live loop that into Ableton and then send the the MIDI signals to like hardware synths and so on and so forth and the nice thing about that is that then I could kind of project what I was doing with the video camera I would use like bike lights and I took apart these um, old um, spinning tops that had like weird LED patterns in them oh, yeah. that would help that I would I'd hold those right up to the camera, and I'd see you get all this blurry LED stuff going on by holding it right up there. And so, right. so we'd project that visual, and then I would sort of use that visual to to generate the the MIDI that was going out to these different instruments. I see, I see. And then, um, and then, sort of live loop some of that stuff while Graham would go nuts on drums. We're using now. I'm using more of a traditional sort of sequenced some things sequenced ahead of time in the a4 and then you know and then playing lines on top of it on the um, moog sub 37 for that project but the other two projects i play in are more sort of like just playing my instrument so i use a rhodes electric piano for for the chords and i run that through like a delay and, and then i have like the sub 37 which is also running through a delay at times and and it's more like, you know, improvising with, with these other artists. One of one of those projects is called DKO. It's this guy, John Davis, on bass. And he also switches off to bass clarinet, um, which is really fun. And also Graham O'Brien on drums. And then so the three of us kind of just experiment in that realm. And we've done some things where we've been experimenting with textual scores as well. And actually, that's your fault because <laughs> I heard your uh, interview with uh, Pauline Oliveros, and I was really fascinated by by her work and so I looked into it and did some research and and I wanted to experiment in that realm and uh, so we've done a few things with with this idea of, of uh, textual scores. In fact, I, I did. There's have you ever heard of Northern Spark? It's a yearly um, f festival that we have here in Minneapolis. Yes, I've played there. It's, uh, it's not the same as the Spark Festival. Oh, I, think I thought they was, were the same. Yeah, no, the, the Spark Festival, I also played at the Spark Festival, which that was amazing. That was like a, more of an electronic music and art festival. Right, right. Northern Spark is a really great event put on by Steve Dietz. Um, it goes all night. It's a, It starts at, at in the evening, and it finishes in the morning. Oh, okay. And uh we, we have like 50,000 people come through this thing and there's projects everywhere all over the city, sometimes Minneapolis and St. Paul, sometimes it's just in Minneapolis or just in St. Paul. Uh -huh. It's been going on since 2011. And I've been involved in one way or another since since it started. But uh, this last year was you know June 2015. Um, I, I worked on a project with my students called Instant Composer. Uh, Mad Libbed Music was the subtitle. And we developed a web app that could be accessed via your mobile phone or, you know, you could go to this kiosk with an iPhone on it. And uh, it's a little five-step process. You could write one of these scores, these textual scores, and then they would go up on a projector screen with some spectral analysis in the background. 
it was an ensemble of musicians that would just read these scores and then we would just go for it and, oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> and play whatever we wanted to based on what people had written. Right. It was really fun. We, uh, we did 69 of these compositions over the, over the length of the performance. It was incredible. Wow. But um, the, the, it was just amazing what people came up with too. You know, we, we, Gave them, you know, and the, the app had like ways for them to sort of pick things from menus. But if they wanted to, they could just type stuff in. And so people typed in things about geometry or they would type in things about, you know, different modes. One person's mood. So one of the questions was mood. One, one person's mood was uh, the 15 minutes after my divorce was final. <laughs> so I don't, know, I don't know if that's like a good thing or a bad thing. Necessarily. Could, be, could go either way, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> imagining so how to interpret that as an improviser was, oh, right. was, was really you know just kind of invigorating well and I have to admit that of all the cities in the United States I think that Minneapolis is one of the few where you could do something like that and not some have somebody just stand there and just type shit 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 over and over again right <laughs> yeah well you know I we we were moderating these so I had students who were working this little moderation booth okay. but there weren't that many that were just all penises or anything. Right, you know? right. So, so people were actually wanted to see their scores up there and one. You know, there were a few people who were trying to like promote their their uh, Twitter account and yeah, you right. know or their their ad firm or something. But uh, <laughs> you know, we we managed to moderate those out. Well, what is <laughs> what is it about Minneapolis though, Minneapolis St. Paul that seems so open to that kind of stuff? Because you mentioned Spark Festival which always was kind of a, a really cool combo of sort of like dance electronic, but experimental electronic too. They kind yeah. of wove those together. But just a lot of other, I mean, I've performed up there in a number of different kind of scenarios. And it, there's always, first of all, a warm embrace from an audience, which isn't always the case. But mm -hmm. also just a real acceptance of, of art for art's sake by... The, the city and the community, it seems like a kind of a, a magical place for that reason. And I'm, why, why Minneapolis? Why are they like that? You know, and it's funny because, you know, when Ali Mamani Mumont, was up there, you know, he was doing all the projection stuff. Yeah, um, I, I was involved with him in, in a lot of that. That was really, yeah. really that fun been amazing. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, a lot of people, Doug Gears, when he was up there, was doing amazing, uh, amazing work as well. It's just a lot of fantastic stuff is, has, has or is going on in Minneapolis. What do you think makes Minneapolis that place? I agree. I, I don't know. It's hard to put a finger on it. But I think one of the things that um, is interesting is that, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of, um, larger area larger cities where the scenes sort of gel together and it's sort of like everybody's in this scene and then you know someone else is in this scene and they, they, there's less cross pollination i think because minneapolis is so small one of the things like if you're a good drummer if you want to play jazz you can go and play jazz but people are going to ask you to play blues they're going to ask you to play you know, singer songwriter stuff. They're going to ask you to play in all these other projects, rock projects. And so, if any, you know, these great jazz drummers we have, like JT Bates, for example, or Dave King, you know, um, JT Bates plays in so many different projects and he's amazing in all of them. And I think that what happens is, you know, if we've got these great musicians, but they're also willing to sort of, you know, cross pollinate into these other scenes sure. and play electronic music instead of just jazz music and have an electronic music night that they that they do and so that's one thing um but i'm not i'm not sure i mean it seems it's it is a really great place i love being here and um, um i love also other parts of the world i i performed at the echo flux festival in prague and that was amazing um just to be part of that festival and, and be in that part of the world but um yeah it, it's you know the winters are brutal here, <laughs> but yeah. but um, you know it's I've uh, I've been sticking it out for quite some time now. Interesting. Well, I've got family up there, so next time I come to visit Minneapolis, I'll look you up and we'll go out and have a beer or something. That, that'd be great. I would love that. All right. Well, um, as is 
seems to be typical. Uh, I've kind of blown through the time. I really appreciate you uh, setting aside the time to talk talk to me. It's been really great. Um, before we go, a couple of things. First of all, I, I've got this question that I keep on trying to get people to answer because fun stuff sometimes comes out of it, which is um, if you ran into the 18 to 21 year old version of yourself, what would you tell that person uh, to either make the way easier or make it usefully harder or basically tell them to get a law degree? You know, what, what, what would you, what would you yeah. do? Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> it's funny because, you know, a lot of people, you know, in interviews when they're asked something like, Oh, what were your, what are your regrets? Oh, I have no regrets. And I just think that's a lot of bullshit. I think everybody, <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> everybody has regrets, right? And so uh, maybe regrets is the wrong, wrong word, but, um, you know, everybody wishes they would have done something different. If you look back on anything, if you have the hindsight and you can look back on things, of course you would do things a little differently. I would say one of the things I would do is, I, you know, I, I kind of quit college and then went back to college later to, you know, make this career in music because I was going to be a rock star and I was going to be a keyboard player and these, you know, and it was just, you know, kids, me being a kid and being silly. I wish I would have stayed in school um, and gotten my um, bachelor's degree sooner and gotten my MFA sooner. Um, although, you know, a lot of that experience was probably really good. And who knows if I would, if I would have done that, what, how things would have gone now. But, um, you know, that and, you know, sticking it, sticking it out with piano lessons a little longer and, you know, focusing more on, you know, learning music a little bit. But, um, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty confident as a musician, but it's amazing how you can just keep learning. Like I just started taking piano lessons again after sort of a long hiatus from piano lessons. And I don't think I would have, you know, picked up on the sort of things I'm picking up on now from my teacher, you know? Right. And so it's, it's, it's great. You know, it's like, even after all these years, I'm learning new stuff about jazz piano theory, scale theory. It's, it's super fun to kind of experience that now. And even though I wish I would have learned it years ago, you know, we're always learning. And I think that's the thing is that life is just a big, long learning experience. Sure. Well, I think, I think you actually hit on something though important there too, which is this idea that, if you would have done stuff earlier, it might not have led you down the road that you that you eventually took. And, you know, I always think in terms of like, so I, I studied jazz and I, I was a pretty good guitarist, but I damaged my hands and I couldn't really play really aggressive stuff anymore. Um, it caused me to have to learn a whole bunch of things, but it also got me more involved in art rather than music and being a musician. And it changed my perspectives on things. And now when I learn stuff, it, it's learning, it's, it's sort of like taking these new ingredients and adding them to already a hearty stew, right? Yeah. And I think that that's a, that's a really valuable thing. And I think that then those new influences you get actually have a completely different, you know, I now when I learn something like about theory, for example, it's it's very much like I am learning something that's, that's a new addition to this rich stuff I'm doing rather than saying, okay, I learned something. And now if I'm really serious about being a jazz player, you know, I have to, I have to work hard on jazzifying this thing. Right. And so I think that there's something really valuable to kind of like adding things to a, a mature artist arsenal. Absolutely. You can always add to your vocabulary and, and I think sometimes we have a fear of that. Like you, you hear, you know, some sort of complex word or phrase and you don't know what it means. Well, that's okay. You don't have to know what it means. Not everybody else does either, but don't be afraid to try to figure out what it means right. and find out what it means and, and then apply that to your own vocabulary. Right. Absolutely. So John, um, where can people go to find uh, more information about you and uh, your work? Uh, a number of places there's john just john keston.com is sort of a, a selected portfolio of things um audiocookbook.org is where i sort of blurt out all my random experiments and um you know just share everything that's going on um 
Then I, on SoundCloud, I have a soundcloud.com slash Ostraka. It's O-S-T-R-A-K-A. And uh, that's, you know, some of the Ice Cold stuff is there. Some of my solo stuff is there. Some of the duet and trio stuff is there, too. All right. And the Ice Cold release itself, which, again, I fell in love with, where would people go to purchase that? So it's Icicles spelled I-S-I-K-L-E-S dot bandcamp dot com. Okay, fantastic. Uh, John, I want to thank you so much for spending the time. It's been great to talk talk with you and great to hear about the directions that you've taken and also kind of intriguing me to check out some new things. I'm always, I always get inspired when I talk to people. So uh, it was great to be, to get that from you. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Darwin. It was really great talking to you, and I look forward to meeting you in person. All right. Sounds great. Thanks a lot, and I'll talk to you soon. All right. Cheers. And there you go. Another great interview. Thanks a lot to John for spending the time to talk to us. It was really great to hear about it. There's some uh, pretty interesting insights in there that I need to do a little check it out on. Um, furthermore, please take the opportunity to uh, go to our website, which is artmusictech.libsyn.com, and uh, click on some of the links that we provided in this week's episode. Also check out some of the older episodes. There's some really good stuff out there. Uh, We're getting close to number 100, which Gregory Taylor tells me is going to be very special. So... (laughs) Um, I hope uh, we follow through on that. And so with that, I want to thank you again for your uh, listenership, for sticking with me through all of these episodes, and I will see you next week. Bye.